and void. Our Father, this is your word. And we come here to hear your word. We, we ask that you would indeed speak to us. We pray, Lord, that you would use uh, faltering lips, uh, this instrument, that you would uh, speak through it and make your name known and high and lifted up. We pray that your word would go forth, that it would not return empty and void, but would accomplish all that it has set out to do. And we pray, Lord, also for your people, for those here, that you would soften hard hearts and open blind eyes, you would unstop our ears. We pray, Lord, make us receptive to your word. And Father, we pray uh, now, even as we gather, that you would bless this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you've uh, ever played a sport growing up, if you've ever played one of any kind, you realize and you know that there's a lot of meaning in the phrase home stretch. I mean, it refers to, if you're running a race, the last leg of that race, the last leg of a marathon, that last few innings of the baseball game where you're tired, you're worn out, you've run a long race, but the end is in sight. You see the end coming on and you are pressing on towards the finish line, towards the end goal that is right before you. We use this phrase, and we use it often in many different ways. We use this phrase when we take uh, long journeys or road trips. Uh, I can remember many times riding along with my family and just say, them saying, we're in the home stretch, just relax, we'll make it. Uh, it's the same idea uh, going on that we're talking about here. And we use this phrase in the working world when tired employees will pick up the pace because they are ready to complete their work, the particular task that has been given to them when they know that that deadline is right before them and they are nearly done. They're on the home stretch. This morning, as we come to the last of the seven feasts here given to Israel, the last of the annual feasts that Israel was to celebrate each year, we come to what is called the home stretch feast. This is the feast that is known as the Feast of Booths. And you might know this feast in the New Testament, it's uh, called the Feast of Tabernacles. But in the Jewish world, this is the Feast of Feasts. This is the big kahuna, this is the big one. You see, all of Israel, the Israelite males have three pilgrimage feasts in which they are required to go up to Jerusalem. Every household was to be represented in the capital city of Israel. And they are to go up to Jerusalem, and those are for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Harbit, and what's the last one is called the Feast of Ingathering, or the Feast of Booths. But this last feast... This feast that we're looking at today, this feast is the feast when all the harvest has finally been gathered in. This is the grandest feast, so much so that it began to be known in the Jewish world as the feast. When you spoke of the feast, you were talking about this one, the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Gathering, the Feast of Tabernacles. This is not one of the feasts. This is the feast, the most important, the climactic feast of them all. This is the most joyous feast of them all. This is the one where the wine came uncorked by the gallons. This is the one where meat abounded. Food was for everyone, feasting all week long. And there was some, uh, some to spare because the harvest had been brought in. It had reached its completion and had been brought in in full. This is a time of great rejoicing and partying, something that we have never seen in America. In fact, if you want an idea of what this celebration is like, you can go to a place like 1 Samuel 1. This is the context of the feast that's going on there. Whenever Eli sees Hannah and thinks that she is drunk, it's because this is the feast that is in the background. This is the feast of celebration. And apparently it wasn't uncommon when someone had a little bit too much because there's so much rejoicing and celebration going on here in Jerusalem that the priest rebukes Hannah. 
And I'd love to uh, make some modern day uh, contemporary comparison to this type of partying that they're doing, but I really can't uh, because we don't have anything like this today. The most we have, the closest we have is Christmas Day. This is the pinnacle of the year for them. But it lasts for seven days and seven nights, a real humdinger of a party. This feast, it's huge too. It's not just that it's the greatest or the grandest. It's the biggest as well. You'll, they double all of the usual sacrifices. If you notice the list that is given in verse 37, the food offering, the burnt offering, the grain offering, sacrifices, drink offerings, all of which is on top of the normal vow offering and free will offering that is always given. And the question we need to answer to understand this feast, the question that we need to get at to grasp what this feast has to tell us is why. Simply put, why is this the grandest feast? What is it about this particular feast? What makes this feast such a joyful occasion? If God commanded me to live in a hut for a week, as if uh, I think he did, I mean, as he did with the Israelites, excuse me, I'm not sure I would feel like partying like this. I'm not sure I would be ready to celebrate and, uh, and just rejoice in the way the Israelites are commanded to do, and do so in fact. So what is it about this particular feast that the Israelites are celebrating? What makes it so joyful to them? What makes it so grand? This morning, we're going to be looking at how the Feast of Booths celebrates two things primarily. It celebrates, first of all, the provision of God for his people. And secondly, the presence of God with his people. And we're going to see what this means for us as well, as the people of God. For these feasts require something of us today as well. This isn't an obscure text to an obscure people. This text is to us. And though he's, we're not building and living in huts, this feast does have application to us. And so this morning we're going to begin by looking at God's provision for his people. God's provision for his people. And beloved, it's helpful uh, when looking at this feast, when seeing what this feast celebrates, to again notice when we are in the calendar year. Again, this roughly marks the months of uh, September and October. And if you think about our own September and October and this time of year, this is when we break out the apple cider, right? This is when we uh, go pick pumpkins at the pumpkin patch. And it's really the reason that originated is to celebrate the end of the harvest. The harvest has been brought in. Every fruit of the field and all the fields, or all the um, grains of the field, the fruit of the vine have been brought in. And this is true for Israel as well. The olives, the grapes, the wheat, the barley, the fig trees, the pomegranates. In short, everything that Israel produ produces, all the fruit of the vine, and the grains of the field have finally and completely, in entirety, been gathered in. All the physical needs of Israel have been taken care of, even more so than they could hope or imagine. Beyond blessing, beyond what they actually need. The abundance here at the end of this year is uh, fourfold. I mean, it reminds you of passages of Scripture like Isaiah 55, where God tells his people that if you thirst, if you thirst or hunger, come to me. But instead of giving you what you just need, bread and wine, I will bless you with milk and honey and wine and abundance, far more than what you deserve. And without cost, I will bless you abundantly and in fullness. There will be a fullness of of blessing. And that type of blessing that you see in Isaiah 55, that fullness of blessing, is exactly what is reflected in our text before us this morning. And notice, I mean, you can see this just by looking at the list of sacrifices brought. 
I've already noted that it is double the usual list, and you can uh, see this if you go to Numbers 28 and 29 and compare the two lists. Numbers 28 is where the normal amounts of all the feasts are given, and then compare it to the Feast of Tabernacles. And you see the sacrifices are at least double. Now, it's not as though God is a heavy taskmaster here who requires much of his people, who requires his people to make uh, bricks without straw. And you'll notice he hasn't asked for double the sacrifices in the dead of winter, has he? He asks for it now because there is an abundance. The abundance is available and he asks for much out of Israel when they are experiencing times of plenty. Because the fruit is available and the physical needs of all of Israel have been met. And so at this time, God requires his people in thanksgiving, not just to give, but to give out of their abundance to him. To give out of what has first been given to them. When the blessings are fullest and most abundant, and in their abundance, sacrifice these to their God. He's not, or doubling the sacrifices, excuse me, is not the only way the text alludes to the fullness of blessing here and the full provision God has been giving to his people. There's another detail in the text, and it's easily overlooked, that alludes to the fullness of blessing as well. Notice how often a particular number is repeated throughout this text when they are speaking of this particular feast. In verse 34, he says, Moses, speak to the people of Israel, saying, on the 15th day of the seventh month. In verse 39, he says, on the 15th day of the seventh month. In verse 41, he says, you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord seven days. No other feast repeats this idea of seven so much. The seventh month, for seven days you shall feast. And if you count, verses 36 and 40, 42, seven is actually written here seven times within 11 verses. Now this may seem like I'm pulling things out of Scripture that aren't actually here, but there are no accidents in Scripture. So why the special emphasis on the sevens? What is so special about this number at this particular feast? Well, Scripture teaches us elsewhere that seven is a number that refers to completion, to fullness, to perfection. And the fullness of blessings and harvest are here in mind as well. God has provided all of Israel needs. You remember they wandered a wilderness for 40 years where there was no food. And now they are here in the promised land, gathering in the grain of the field and the fruit of the vine. God has provided for them far beyond anything that they require. And the people are called to praise Yahweh, for he alone gives you all of these blessings. Not Moloch, not Baal, not a golden calf who gives you everything, but Yahweh, the one who brought you out of Egypt, the one who brought you up from the house of bondage. And this fullness of blessing, it goes far beyond the physical, doesn't it? God certainly and very clearly has provided for his people physically. But more importantly, he's provided for them spiritually. Only five days before this particular feast takes place on the calendar is the Feast of Atonement that was going on in full swing. This people of God now, after atonement has been made, is able to enter into the presence of God himself, wholly clean. God has provided a sacrifice that covers over all of their sins. And now, because of that sacrifice, which points beyond itself to the greater sacrifice of Christ Jesus for sins yet to come, because of that sacrifice that is coming, this people is now able to stand and indeed rejoice and play before the Lord and celebrate the presence of God himself. And this brings us to our second point this morning. God's presence with his people. God's presence with his people. It's amazing how detailed 
uh, the structure of these feasts are and how they flow together as a whole. It's amazingly intentional, uh, so much so that we can say it's divinely intentional. If you think back to how the Feast of Trumpets announced that a holy God is coming, and the very next feast that follows after a holy God is announced to be coming into their presence is the Feast of Atonement. And it announces their need for an atonement, their need for a sacrifice for sins to be made so that man can enter into God's presence. And this ultimately points to Christ and his perfect sacrifice on behalf of you and me, his people. For in the end, we know that blood of goats and bulls cannot take away sin. But the point of that feast is to show that by, or to show that our sins need to be dealt with indeed. And they will ultimately be dealt with by the god men and have been dealt with. And then we come to the Feast of Booths that follows on the heels of the atonement. And God, this Holy One, in whom there is no sin, in whom there is no jot or tittle of it, this Holy God comes he enters into the presence of his people. Yahweh tabernacles with his people. And this people who are dwelling in booths are brought into the fullness of blessing. This people lacks nothing, both spiritually as they look to the harvest, as they open their eyes and look around them. They lack nothing physically and spiritually as well as they remember what has just gone on before. And the people spend the next seven days rejoicing and feasting day after day, day in and day out, for God is near and he is for us and not against us. He is not distant, but he has drawn near to us. Do you know that truth? Do you rest in that truth? That God has drawn near to us in the person of Christ Jesus that he has delivered us from the body of sin and he now sees us as holy in his sight and he draws near to his people in that God-man named Christ. God really and truly has drawn near and is dwelling with us or tabernacling with us as John 1 told us. God is here and he is with us. But this all brings us to one final question. Why the booths? This is, after all, called the Feast of Booths and the Feast of Tabernacles. Why erect these temporary buildings for a week and live in them? What does dwelling in these temporary huts point toward? For surely it points to something. Why make booths out of palm branches and myrtle and olive trees, all splendidly leafy trees, and branches, as the text even tells us, and then after setting them up, why dwell in them? Verse 43 tells us that it's to remember that God has made them dwell in booths, but what's the point of that? What is the text getting at by even saying that? The text is surely looking back to the wilderness journey, but it's also looking beyond itself to something far greater. One of the points the Boots has looked back on that we've already seen. God dwelt with his people in the wilderness. God tabernacled with his people. And as the people of Israel came through the wilderness, God came down and he dwelt and he tabernacled among them and he lived in a dwelling made from the same material as the Israelite tent. And their home was his home, even as they dwelt as pilgrims on a way in a dry and weary land. People of God, do you see this, the connection here? That this God of the Hebrews, our God, this God promises his people, you and me, he promises in this feast that though we walk along a path filled with dangers, toils, and snares, he is the God who will bring us home. He will bring us through the final home stretch. 
He is the God who is faithful to his promises, just as he brought Israel into a land flowing with milk and honey, a home surrounded by flora and fauna, leafy trees, fruit trees, and grain, and the booths themselves are made out of the lush trees of the promised land. Just as God did for Israel, he will do for you. He is a faithful God, and he will bring us to our heavenly home. And he does this through no less means than his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who came to earth, as John said, and he tabernacled among us, and he became an atonement for our sins so that you and I, a people, could dwell with the Father in unending joy. Beloved of God, do you doubt that God is good to you? Do you doubt it because you look around you and all you see is a weary, dry wilderness? You see suffering and a sin-torn world. People of God, doubt no more, for Christ has died. Christ has risen and Christ will come again. This feast of booths, as you look back to this text, it calls us to remember that God has provided for you, his people, both physically and spiritually. He has provided for you the blood of his very son. And this God who gave us such a precious gift, such a precious one to him on your behalf, will he withhold good gifts from you? Will he not provide for your needs? I don't think that's a fair question at this point. Our Father has made it abundantly clear through the death of Christ that he will provide for his people, even providing a way home. The right question at this point is how can we not respond in thanksgiving to the one who provides for all that we need? That is what this text calls us to do. We are to praise God for all that he has done. But this isn't directionless. This isn't just make it up and freelance praise. We aren't free to make up how to respond to God in praise. We simply respond back to God the same way in which he has blessed us, both spiritually and physically. Spiritually, we praise him. We gather together, we worship, we sing songs, we pray, and our life is shaped by our praise to him. But we also praise God with physical gifts, giving offerings unto God, not because he needs it, but because we are grateful for what he has first done for us. We simply respond in generosity to a God who has first been generous to us. We use the physical gifts and abilities, whatever they may be, it's not necessarily monetary. I am not getting on that ship at all. It's whatever gifts he has given to you to physically bless his people, to help his people, to help build up the body in a full unity. Do you see a brother or sister in need? Something that you can help with and by help them. And by doing so, you praise God for the blessings of the Son of God that have been given for you. Beloved, how are you doing on your home stretch? Are you fearful of what may come? God is with you in Christ. Who can be against you? Are you fearful whether all your needs will be met, whether you will have all that you need? God clothes the flowers of the field more splendidly than Solomon. Will he not provide for you? Has he not provided you with your greatest need already, providing you his only son? Are you grateful for what God has done? Then give freely and generously of the gifts that God has given to you. For God has been more generous than we have ever thought or could possibly imagine. People of God, may we praise our God with the gifts he has given to us, spiritually and physically, because he first loved us. Not to earn his favor, but because he first loved us and bought us and pitied us when we were enemies of God. And he provided for us in all things by his son. 
in whom we have the forgiveness for all our sins. Let us pray. Father, we are weak and weary sinners. And Father, we know that we have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We know that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And we pray, pray, Lord, that you please spare us. That you would forgive us of our sins. Father, we pray that you would help us to see our need of you, our ever-present need, both spiritually and physically, for you to bless us. We pray that you would look on the merits and works of Christ Jesus, as our, who is our Savior, when you look upon us. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to know the fullness of blessing that is ours in him. That you would fill our hearts with gratitude because of this magnificent and unimaginable work that you have done. Father, we pray that you would continue to be with us now. We pray that you would be with your pilgrim people throughout this short week. We pray as we go forth from this place that you would make your presence known to us. That you would make your face shot, smile upon us. Father, we ask that you would uh, strengthen your people by the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray together. Amen.